I'm back with friend of the show, friend That's of right. friend of the podcast. Mm-hmm. It's your second time on, right? Second time, yeah. How since the first time you came on the podcast, which was now many years ago, I feel like it might have been 2021, 2021, 2022. I don't know. I don't think it was 2022. Was it? God, it's crazy I feel that it's like, like, like 2024, though. Oh my god, that's insane. Because I feel like maybe it was, was yours the podcast that I was doing when I was like in Florida at uh, like I was like in uh, yes, yeah, and I was with the the polyamorous cult people yes. with their other family, and we were all okay. Then that was February of 2022. Okay, that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah, you were and you were kind of just beginning your journey of becoming a based lesbian. <laughs> no, that's not that's not exactly accurate. I have always been a based no, lesbian. No, I mean you've always been a based lesbian, but I feel like you you were in a in in transition. <laughs> yeah, so I was transitioning. Well, how would you describe it? Okay, for a long time I have mm-hmm. been paying attention to the, you know, kind of gender dynamics and like what we were doing with that in the in the gay world and the lgbt etc world and i've always known you know first of all i'm like a devil's advocate kind of person and so i'm always questioning things and so even back in the day when it was like when gay people when i was like in high school and we were all debating gay marriage and everything like that um people kept saying you know well we're born this way so you have to give us the same rights as anybody else. And even then I was like, well, I don't know if we're born this way. I think things are <laughs> a little more complicated than that. It depends on the culture you're in, how those genes are going to express and and everything. So I've always been kind of like, I'm not just going to follow along with whatever the politically expedient narrative is mm. that we're doing just to get our, I'm like, that's always going to have, there's going to be pitfalls if we right. lie in order to get what we want. And, and of course, like lying, it's like most people who are singing Lady Gaga years later, you know, they do, they do believe that we're born this way, but which is very strange, especially now that everything's so fluid and right and malleable and whatever. Um, but so I've always been like, I'm not just going to swallow the orthodoxy of whatever the gay community is, is saying. And when we were calling, when, when we were saying that conservatives were being completely moronic to say that there could ever be a slippery slope dynamic. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. I think if we change this major thing, <laughs> things might start getting a little fuzzier about <laughs> other stuff. I mean, none of us would have predicted what's happened with gender, but um, but I was like, yeah, no, I, I think the, the poly thing, I was like, definitely the polyam, the po- polygamy, polyam, really, th- that stuff's going to take off more if we I do feel change. I like Camille Paglia did predict the sure. slippery slope. I think a lot of us did. I think a lot of us were like, mm. <laughs> yeah, it's going to, if you put things on a direction, things will continue going <laughs> in a direction. So by the time, like the trans stuff was always something I was kind of, like aware of by by college, I started meeting people who identified as as trans and who had transitioned hormonally. I'd met a, a little bit like at gay groups and would just have interesting conversations with them. But I was also having interesting conversations with people who were would would tell me that they were uh, attracted to children and mm. planned on moving to Mexico one day where they could live in a community of, you know what I mean? So it's like I was in college, like these these gay groups had all kinds of stories in them. And I was like, all right. I, you know, I had been raised Mormon and here I am just like learning a lot about lots of different walks of life. Where'd you go to college? Uh, University of Texas at Dallas. OK. And there was just like a gay group there that I joined. And um, yeah, there's a guy who, you know, he'd been molested as a kid and he was he thought that's probably why that was his root of why he was attracted to kids. Uh-huh. And but he thought you know, the Greeks and the Romans, oh, and, boy. you know, and then there's cultures where you swallow semen in order to become a man. And, uh, you know, you know, that tribe, the maps, <laughs> well, yeah, the map tribe. No, but you know what I'm talking about. There's yeah. that cult, that tribe where they, you, the, the young boys 
suck the old guy's dicks because no. oh yeah yeah because they believe that that's that semen is what makes you into a man <laughs> it's such a fucking porn it's crazy but there really is this like tribe that i think still does that um and yeah so you know because some pedophile always sneaks his way into everything and like it's like oh you know what makes you a man is <laughs> sucking a big grown man's dick yeah yeah <laughs> and so there's a whole tribe where they've got the boys sucking their dicks and everything. anyway so catholicism <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly so um yeah i don't know why this guy wouldn't just become a priest like everyone else but he wanted to go live in mexico where he could be free and you know there's places around the world where you can just just do that anyway that's such a tangent but um so i was talking to be and but you know there were also just what looked very clearly to be mentally deranged grown men wearing dresses but mm-hmm. not shaving their beards or various things like that and not in the way because like nowadays there's all this non-binary and people might just be doing it for the gram mm-hmm. people might be just you know like a lock or some of the you know that non-binary person who wears the condom hat in the middle ground do you ever watch middle ground the no. jubilee videos okay never no, mind. no there's a lot of these people who are like perform clearly very performatively non-binary mm. usually like dudes right who are just wearing ridiculously femme outfits but with their chest hair and yeah. shoulder hair everywhere and stuff like that going on so it wasn't that you know it was like just middle-aged men who were awkwardly wearing a dress. You know what I mean? And yeah. like you can tell, like, they're very, they're weird in the head. Yeah. So there was a lot of that. And I just was kind of like, huh, this is interesting. And and then in when I lived in Boston, you know, I I had this experience of, of like, this this trans woman coming to you know a women's it was just like a discussion group it wasn't even mm. like a book club it was like this discussion group and we were it was, it was supposed to be like a female discussion group and this is before any of the like trans war stuff at yeah. all it just so it wasn't even a thing like no one was thinking about whether trans people were admitted or not and so it was you know this trans woman shows up and it was just a matter of course that we would have her in but but she was started hijacking every conversation to make it about trans stuff and how oppressed she was and how none of her kids talked to her. And so like three weeks in a row of that and I just stopped going. And so like, you know, my experiences were all kind of like, mm, this is a weird community. Mm. Um, some of the younger people seemed, you know, very genuinely like, you know, dysphoric and like I was happy for them. These older people all seemed unhinged to me. And that was just kind of, you know, what I walked into it where, when I moved to Austin, I started making friends with trans people. We had three trans women. Well, we yeah, three trans women comedians here in mm-hmm. Austin. And it was a fairly small scene in 2015. Yeah. Um, but by yeah, by the end of 2015, I had three trans women friends and one of them became my best friend. And, you know, she just had such a dark sense of humor. And it was also like we could she she would call a spade a spade. You know, there was no. Like, you know, we could talk about her, you know, having been a boy and right. being male in various ways and, and whatever. And so it was just so refreshing to be able to just talk openly and honestly and joke around with someone who like, yeah, this is a crazy like lifestyle. You got, you know, right. it's a whole wild situation. I'm fascinated by it. And she and I just had very like we could be very candid about like really fucked up stuff. And we started this podcast called Gender Fluids together. And um, we did that for six or seven years. I think you still had it. No. When yeah, you, I think when we, we were, were still. Yeah, we were still at least doing it every now and then until how long ago, Justin? A year? About a year ago, maybe. OK, yeah. She quit. I don't think I think less than a year she officially quit. I think it was maybe all oh, the time goes by so fast. Um, And, you know, and then I've met more and more trans people and became friends with them. I um, it, but I would say by 20. 16 2017 like the narrative started really shifting where it wasn't just hey like we're people who have this this severe gender dysphoria who really like hate that we were born this way and we really just need the relief of these things and yeah I was a boy but now I've transitioned to being as female as possible and it was now it became no, you can't call us biological men. You can't say we're biologically male. Like that's and at first it was like, that's just hateful to like bring it up. Yeah. But then it transitions to, well, we're not biologically male. And I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, you're kind of biologically intersex now. Right. But you're <laughs> like, oh, no, 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 okay. I'm like, okay, well, and then it became, well, we're female. Mm-hmm. Well, we've actually always been female. And 
that that kind of stuff was just like, I can't I don't know how to talk about this anymore. If we don't have any words, I could I can say you're a woman, but you're not female. You're more female than you used to be. Like I could talk those ways. But if I can't talk in a way that makes any sense, like this is seem, starting to seem really not just annoying, but like dangerous. Right. To to take away the language to be able to describe reality started to feel really dangerous to me. And so at some point I kind of knew I was like, all right, I love these people. I like all my trans friends and stuff. And I and I, you know, care about their rights and I want this, but whatever. But I'm like, I started to see, I think things are going weird here. I think mm-hmm. something's going off. And and even in 2012, you know, I started noticing, you know, lesbians were starting to become gender neutral. They didn't want to be women anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, And there was a lot of talk. There was just a lot of complaining about like nonsense, microaggressions, calling a group of people ladies, Mm -hmm. even if they all were female identified. But you shouldn't have assumed. And it's a gay guy going like ladies. And it's like gay guys call everybody ladies. But we're now this is a big transgression because we're assuming gender and you're not allowed to do that ever. And we got to ask everyone for their pronouns, even though that doesn't make any sense. And by the way, most of the country doesn't subscribe to the idea that we all do have a gender identity. Um, So the idea that we all get to choose bespoke pronouns Mm -hmm. doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't. It And it's really it is like a little psyop, a linguistic device that you go. If we get people to say it's just a nice thing to do to call people their preferred pronouns. And remember, it started preferred, but then it became their pronouns. Right. You know, and it's not just a preference. In fact, it's transphobic to call it a preference because they just are their pronouns. You know, so every time we would kind of, because we wrote we wrote them a blank check, right? Mm-hmm. We were like, the right side of history. We know we got civil rights, gay stuff. Now we're doing trans. Everyone's born that way, right? <laughs> Even though, though it might be fluid. And, <laughs> and so we wrote them a blank check as the good liberals. And they ran with it. And, you know, it never should be a blank check, you know, especially when you're talking about changing people's bodies and changing kids. And Mm -hmm. and then the fact that you do have to balance out um, female rights with trans women rights, because. I mean, all this the furthest example that, you know, is just that, you know, what California has with the self ID to go into prisons. Yeah. Well, okay. you don't think any men are going to game that system, whether consciously or unconsciously, just decide that they're women in order to. I mean, like, especially criminals, criminals. Yeah. Like like there's always (laughs) men. There are always males who are predators who are gaming. You know, they'll yeah. become a father in order to molest kids. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. They'll be, there's so they'll become a Santa. They'll become a priest. Yeah. Like you don't think they'll become a woman. You don't think some of them, especially if some of them are turned on by the idea of being a woman. And yeah. now you've got all these philosophers explaining to them that if you get hard when you put on women's panties, then that you probably are actually female. And mm-hmm. I mean, so everything just got crazy. And I was watching it all get crazy. I mean, I dated a trans dude in 2018 and I was like really into him um, for for a minute. I think he you know, when I met him, he I thought it was I was like, oh, it's one of the little boy lesbians. Right. But then he was like, I'm a, I'm a man. And I'm like, <laughs> sure you are. And <laughs> no, but it was hot. And I, and I was like, OK, cute. And he wanted to think of us as gay boys together. And that was like affirming for me because I do think of myself as a dude. I just don't buy into the idea that like there is a gender identity. I just think it's like there's a lot of factors going on depending on your genes and your culture and kind of how they're expressed at the time. And I'm more on the dude, but we always knew that half of us lesbians were low key half dudes. Right. We are. We always knew that we didn't need to cut off our boobs. I mean, if you have really big ones, it's fucking weird. You know what I mean? But like, so, so I did that with him, but I think that because when I met him, he was only on, he'd only been on T for three months. By the time I broke up with him, he'd been on T for like six or seven months. And I think it was just like, he was becoming too much of a teenage boy. And I was like, uh, nope, I don't like this anymore. Um, you know, he was smelling and uh, was selfish sexually and <laughs> like just really kind of yikes. was becoming an obnoxious teenage boy. And I'm like, mm-hmm. oh, OK, well, I was into you when you were more on the lesbian side. You know, sorry. <laughs> like and I it wasn't that I meant to, you know, I was I, I was buying in as much as I could to the idea that he was a dude and we were being dudes together. But like looking back, it really feels like me. We're more like playing Ken dolls together. Right. Um, which is super hot. You know, I love role playing. So like I can role play. but 
Um, anyway, so point being, I was very like deep into the 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 g- gender world, the trans world, everything. You know, like had lots of lots of friends over there, and um, but I also was watching things get crazier and crazier. But I didn't engage in much of the like any of the podcasts or book. I mean, most of the books hadn't been written yet. Right. Um, but there wasn't a ton of you know there weren't people I could talk to about what was going on, um, except for like, you know, maybe my girlfriend after, after the trans dude, um, I dated a woman for a few years who, you know, had to listen to a lot of this shit. (laughs) And so like, I, but, you know, I didn't have very many people I could talk to. And I think by 2020, when we were all online a lot, um, I, I think it was when JK Rowling you know, did her woman, wumpood, wumu, whatever, tampon tweet. Yeah. And then the, the, what I would call the AGP army, um, (laughs) just, you know, you need to choke to death on my big fat girl cock kind (laughs) Mm -hmm. of stuff to her and, and all that. I'm like, all right, well, they're really showing like, so, you know, people are showing some colors right now. (laughs) And so that sent me to Reddit. I had never really used Reddit before, but there were there were groups at the time on Reddit that were like like people earnestly debating um, gender issues. And I mean, some of them, you know, there's always like the gender critical or turf side. Um, Some of those people were mean assholes, Mm -hmm. whatever. And then some of the trans rights activist people were were all kinds of bastardly and whatever. But there were also lots of people on both sides who were like earnestly having these these discussions. And there was one group in particular called like GC Debates TRAs. Mm. Um, And there were a few groups like that that I really was like I started getting I was like, oh, I love Reddit because as opposed to Twitter, where you only have this many characters. Right. And it kind of lends itself to this these kind of bullshit gotcha quick things like on Reddit. We can all like type out our thoughts. And I feel like it's like people a little bit on the spectrum who were just having these nice (laughs) these like elaborate conversations about like sports and the nuances of things. And and so I was really enjoying that and had found people that I could have like, like healthy like debates with. And um, but then Reddit about two weeks after that, after the JK Rowling thing and me getting on Reddit, Reddit shut down due to pressure. They shut down all of those groups. Oh, wow. So they did like this whole cleanse, this whole purge. I didn't of, realize they shut those down. They shut them down. And so everything like, and I had saved a lot of discussions um, that I wanted to reference later. You know, just me talking to some 17 year old trans chick who's, yeah. <laughs> who's like a little autistic clearly. And I'm, I'm a little autistic, I think. And we're all just, we're just, you know, having these and everything was gone. Everything was gone. Everything was memory hold or whatever. And so um, wild. And so I got off Reddit. I stopped. I mean, now I use it the same way most people do you just look something up every now and then but I stopped using it and but that's when I kind of got into the well I'm not even sure if that happened first or if right before that um a co-worker of mine because I know this also happened in 2020 he we would have discussions and and like really open ones because I could see that we were kind of like-minded and he suggested to me I think it was um Katie Herzog on Dark Horse, one mm-hmm. of their earliest episodes. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I think you'd like this chick. And indeed, I did like this chick. Yeah. And so I think that's what also sent me into the world of like finding that there are these podcasts. And then and then at some point in 2020, right, some of these books start coming out. 2020 yeah. or 2021, you know, Irreversible Damage. Yeah. And um, what's the, what was that Asian chick who wrote the... Deborah So. Deborah So. Remember mm-hmm. hers? Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, also, Helen Joyce had the one that came out a little after. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so all of a sudden it was like, oh, my God, here are the intelligent people who have the same criticisms I do, who have the same questions, who are, you know, doing this. And I had been doing all kinds of like rogue research for years about like 
is this really an epidemic of trans women getting murdered? Yeah, that word it, gets like very. We're fast right. and loose with epidemic. You, I feel if like. for a minute it would be like it would be like twenty two people this year, and I'm like, more people died of coconuts falling on their head. Yeah, the Clintons had more people killed than <laughs> trans women this year. Like, also, it's never mentioned how many actual women are murdered. And in fact, in and so some of. The, I mean, I did some real math on this before. I think that one guy at Quillette eventually did it, but before that. I had done all that math and gone, they're not, get, this isn't, females are getting killed still more. And in fact, in, Way more. in Andrea Longchu's most recent um, nonsense article, the, she said something, she, she says something about how like, oh, actually, you know, the, the feminists just don't think that, um, that trans women are suffering enough, uh, you know, assault and abuse and, and murder and whatever. And, but actually we do get we we do get it more than cis people but because what the articles yeah they get it more than cis people when you include men mm -hmm. but what they don't get is murdered more or raped more than cis females right and so but you can like the little sleight of hand in the way andrea writes that is like to show like oh yeah yeah we get we trans people are suffering more than cis people like no you're not suffering more than cis women yeah you're just suffering more than cis men which yeah should be affirming to you. But. Yeah, isn't that a good thing a good, in yeah. some respects too? That you're not you're not yeah. getting murdered at the numbers. Yeah, like <laughs> they never talk to about you know what industry they're in often, and mm -hmm. and you're already at, a lot of the time it's prostitution. You're already in a high risk situation yeah. where people have a higher likelihood of getting murdered in general. Right. Exactly. There's a lot of the people who are getting killed are prostitutes, drug addicts. A lot of times it has nothing. If you look into the stories, it has nothing to do with them being trans. Sometimes yeah. another trans person kills them and those things. And at first it was like I would see the numbers going up every year. It would be like, oh, last year it was 23 and this year it's 25. But it's like but if you they looked into it like one year, it was only trans women they were counting. And then mm. the next year they were counting both trans men and trans women. It's like, well, of course, the numbers went up. And the next year they are counting non-binary people, too. And, and then you're like. OK, that's part of how the numbers are getting up. And then, yeah, you look into these stories and sometimes it, even like that next Benedict thing. And oh, everyone, yeah, that was whack. But, wacky. Yeah. I mean, last I heard someone said it was suicide now. And I'm like, like an OD or something. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and then there's the story that they were actually the ones who are kind of being started it and were being being. <sighs> Who knows? One of the one of the people, you know, a few years ago who was on the like the black people list of like say their names was a trans dude who was uh had was like had like raped his girlfriend and was there to mm. and was like you know was there being physically violent and stuff and yeah. like the, and so and you're like well I, I I'm not saying that any of these people should get killed but like it is weird to prop up some of these people and yeah. be like, say their name. I'm like, well, look up their name. Yeah. Maybe Google their name because this isn't an epidemic of vi everyone just hate everyone. Oh, we all hate trans people so much, especially when like, yeah, there is a backlash now. Yeah. And I told the trans my trans friends, this is coming. If you guys aren't reasonable, um, yeah. it's going to be bad. We wrote you a blank check, but that's going to go the opposite way. Um, but, you know. People didn't hate them then. A few, you know, like everybody, it was the acceptance was through the roof. No yeah. one had had as meteoric of a rise of acceptance. And in fact, you know, putting people on pedestals and giving them jobs like the trans thing was so popular. It was so like everyone was like, yay, we all feel good about ourselves for telling you guys you're beautiful. So, you know, we just rah, rah, rah. And so the idea that every we were just being told that like we all hated trans people so much and we all just were murdering them and it was so dangerous and they wouldn't live past the age of 35, which was, you know, just Brazilian prostitute, you know, trans women yeah. of color who had that yeah. life expectancy. But then like the, one, someone, that Cox Arquette chick said it oh, on a, yeah, in an yeah. HRC speech or some shit and spread it around. And then that's all it takes for people to copy paste someone's words and no, spread it. No, that's all it takes. I even heard that uh, two months ago in New Orleans, there was a trans chick comic who said something on stage about how she, well, you know, she was acting that way because she was, because she was being weird on stage. And she was like, oh yeah, I know I'm not going to, you know, like statistically I won't live past 35. I'm like, God, like, so they really do. I mean, there are people still believe this shit. Yeah. Like, which is a crazy thing. If you love trans people to tell them you're probably going to get killed by 35. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah. But so, that's what we're doing to the kids with like the the climate, too. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's just like Something's going to kill you by the time you're 35. <laughs> you're gonna, there's a lot of doom in the in the culture at the moment of like telling people that they're likely going to die. <laughs> they're not going to make it. Yeah. I mean, you're probably not going to make it. <laughs> yeah. Well, because you're probably going <laughs> to see 40. Statistically, if climate change doesn't get you, you're likely if, if you're in, you know, one of the younger generations to be trans and then you'll die at 35. <laughs> <laughs> what are we up to with the gender queers now? 48% of Gen Z or whatever is. It's funny. It's going like to die I, at 35. I've been thinking a lot about the first time I really heard about this, was really introduced to it. It was when I was working on a weed farm and I knew I was with a girl who went to Evergreen mm. and it was like she had a trans twin. And I still Identical to this day I have no I have no idea. Yeah. To this day. Because she would like the it was the most mind numbing and insane conversation I've ever had, the first of many. But I was like, okay, so was it a fraternal or identical and excuse me, sororital or She's whatever. A woman. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> yeah, sororital. <laughs> um I was like, is it the and I didn't, you know, you as a normie, I think you would get tripped up and even how to have conversations yeah. about this because you want to be like, is your twin a boy or a girl? Right. And I straight up, I think, did end up saying that. And she was like, well, they wouldn't want me to tell you what they're called. They don't identify as anything. And I'm like, well, oh, they're agent. And I ended up saying something really bad where, where I was like, well, what do, do they go by it? Because I yeah. just didn't know. That's, some people do. Now they do. But this was back in. Like, well, they have. They have. There's always been some people who did. And you could have heard a pin drop in this. And the, you see, if you had just known to say a fab or a map, that's the nothing. way you, you can get away with it. You can ask about people's con congenital genitals if you just use their lingo. I knew nothing. And I had this really good friend who is queer and she's like, I'm not your queer Siri because we were we were roommates and she was yeah. great. But I was like, I knew none of this. Yeah. I didn't know anything about queer theory. I didn't know. It was like my first exposure to it. Yeah. One of the people that we were um, that there was. Someone was coming. It was like a who's on first conversation yeah. where <laughs> yeah. one of the women was dating. It was the first day I had ever yeah. had an, any exposure to. And we were all living in this one house. And this woman kept saying, well, they're coming to stay and to work. And I'm like, how many people? How many people? <laughs> and it's like, well, they're coming with their friend. I'm like, OK, but is he stay. It's like, how do you ask this question? Right. First of all, I'd like Are to know staying? whether there's men or women coming I'm like, over. I just want to know if we have enough fucking beds. Yeah. Like, that's <laughs> all I'm trying to figure out right now. Are they they're driving up with their friend? I'm like, OK, are they both? Are they singular staying or are they plural staying yeah. here? That's all I'm trying to figure out. And it was just hilarious. I'm like, can you see how this would be confusing to the yeah. average person just having trying to have a conversation? Yeah. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. The news. It's always happening. And then afterward, there's always some more of it. Wild how that works. I'm Cody Johnston. And I'm Katie Stoll. And we are the hosts of Some More News and Even More News, the very first podcasts anyone has ever made about the news. Every Wednesday on Some More News, we do a deep dive into a major news topic like corporate lobbying, why housing is so expensive, or Elon Musk's many, many insecurities. And then on Fridays, we're back for even more news to discuss the most infuriating, bizarre, and bizarrely infuriating news of the week. Check out Some More News at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or the other ones, wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, so... You know, I at some point I knew that I was I had to be really in the closet about my thoughts. I mean, partly on, on the Gender Fluids podcast, my friend Ava and I would when the J.K. Rowling thing happened, I think it was like after she wrote the article a few <laughs> days later. And I read that and I was like, all right, she did a pretty good job of explaining herself and sounding whatever. And then all, all the trans, you know, opinion people online just wrote how, hey, look, look, I wrote I read the witches uh, article so you wouldn't have to. I don't want the Holy Spirit to leave you, you know, so you don't need to read that. And I'll just tell you why she's a hateful bitch and should, should die on our girl cocks. And and, you know. 
I, it was just <laughs> crazy making because you're like, no, I pe people read this. Let me know if you read this and you don't kind of see what she's saying. Yeah. And, um, but so we talked about it on gender fluids. And so and that was a rare occasion where we actually like did debate some because like usually I swallowed my tongue on gender fluids a lot. Yeah. Like she would say some crazy shit. And I sometimes I would just like kind of let her because I was like. I want people to hear what yeah. she's saying and like decide for themselves instead of me like yeah. kind of pushing back and go whatever. Like sometimes I would a little bit, you know, I didn't want to let everything go. I definitely would push back here and there, but like, I'm like, mm, I'll just let this speak for itself. And, but with that, like she actually did engage with me about it and we, we discussed it some and, you know, I thought that was really cool. You know, a lot of uh, her friends got really mad at me at that point and started calling me a turf. But, you know, we had a, a pretty measured, reasonable conversation. I thought about it. But, you know, I have very strong feelings about protecting women, protecting yeah. vulnerable females um, and that there are sex differences between males and females and there are sex differences between trans women and, and natal females. And. You know, and of course, it's hard to even talk about it because you follow the rules. You're not even really allowed to point out, you know, and then you have to say AFABs, which is, again, like a seating a point that you don't necessarily yeah. agree with. I don't think we're assigned female. Yeah. In, in the in a few decades ago, plus we were all assigned a gendered expectations would depending on our genitals. And yeah. I agree that that should be, you know, broken down. But um so so definitely like and after and I wanted Ava to like I was hoping on gender fluids that we could because we loved each other so much. I was hoping that we could sometimes have did these difficult discussions. I thought it was really cool to have two people who love each other, really intelligent people, you know, one from, you know, my perspective and one from her perspective, like to, to hash some of these things out that other people weren't talking about, that other people couldn't talk about it from a place of love. And for a while, like she, she said, you know, we, another episode, I remember her saying that like she had increasingly uh, her friends were saying that she shouldn't be friends with me, that she shouldn't platform me with gender fluids, even though like, we started that podcast together, but if, if anything, like it was my baby. Yeah. So like the idea that whatever, um, although she did a lot of, <laughs> she did a lot of work editing it and things. Um, and, <clears throat> but it was my name. And so she, but she talked about how she's like, look, not only we love each other and also like, you know, Ariel has this fucked up dark sense of humor. I don't know. I can't talk to a lot of people right. like I do with her. Like we're, we've been friends for a long time. Like we're not, I'm not just gonna, you know, stopping friends with her because we have little, we have some, you know, political differences and whatever. And then some months after that, um, she said, Hey, I can't do the podcast with you anymore. I mean, she said, we're still friends. It's, you know, it's a little dicey. Um, I would say, um, you know, I think, I don't know how much of it came from her or versus either her girlfriend or some of her friends. Um, cause you know, like she, she has a, a ton of, of trans friends who, you know, a lot of them know me to some extent, you know, we've hung mm -hmm. out, we've partied together to some extent. We've, you know, I used to live with, with Ava. I've lived with her and her girlfriend for several months. And, um, so, you know, I would hang out with all their friends and stuff yeah. like that. And I know there was like one of them who always hated me because she thought I was a eugenicist because I make some jokes about <laughs> eugenic hygiene and whatever. And, um, so there were always some of them who had like these problems and, but you know, they're all, we would hang out and, yeah. you know, do drugs together and whatever, <laughs> you know what I mean? And I would talk to any of them about it. I was always, you know, I'm, I, I'm kind and, and respectful and, um, you know, but, but increasingly, even with my closest friends, if I, if I wanted to say, Hey, I mean, I think self ID is a little bit of a, you know, I was just even, you know, how the phrase, like it, ju I just want to ask questions is now Trump, oh. you know, red coded and, yeah, you know, yeah. like it's just as freedom of speech is and everything like any idea that like that females might have competing interests with trans women is just inherently a cancelable thought. Yeah. And so it, it was, became more and more explicit that I am not to have these questions. This is all wrong. Think mm -hmm. this is all. um yeah, it's just inherently wrong that I even have these questions and I just need to go find my own education camp. That's the other thing. But then they're like, it's not my job to educate you. And it's like, OK, well, if I Google it, there's a lot of people who disagree with you. Right. So I don't know how you think 
it depends on the person's algorithms, what kind of education they're going to go get themselves. Right. Just like you're, it's your opportunity to educate me or to bounce ideas back and forth with me. And if you don't want to take that, like you don't really know what I'm going to get from the Internet. I'm like, because like what they and I didn't tell, you know, all those friends, like I didn't tell them, like I'm reading all the books, I'm reading all the articles, I'm reading, mm-hmm. I'm listening to all the podcasts and all the nuanced ones, you know, like gender, a wider lens and mm-hmm. and everything Lisa Selen Davis has been doing, which, you know, she and I met a long time ago, yeah. you know, like in 2020, like with her book, Tomboy came out. And then I had her on my uh, an old version of of my politically non-binary podcast. Um, and and like, I think that I might have helped radicalize her a tiny bit or whatever, um, because she was still kind of teetering in the in the like, uh, I'm trying to be as respectful as possible, right. and think, whatever. And I think I think like in that conversation, I remember being like, well, things are a little more than you think because I wasn't still at the place I am now, you know, right. but like we were both like kind of exploring like how, what what is the stance to take about a lot of this stuff? And where do you feel like you are now? What I feel like I am now is very I'm very clear, I think, on this. It's like some trans women are women. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. And they're not female. Um they're more female if you take hormones and things than they than they used to be. You essentially what's going on with all of the people who are doing HRT stuff is that they are making themselves into a, a form of an intersex, what we would call an intersex condition. Right. And, you know, all power to adults who want to do that um, for one reason or another. If you're an adult, I don't really care if you do have gender dysphoria or if you um, if you don't, you can do whatever you want to your body. But I think. What's complicated about that is that some there, some of the people who transition really do seem like the sex that they identify as, uh-huh. um, even even outside of the hormone taking. Uh-huh. But especially once they start taking the hormones and things, you can really see it more. But some of the people who are transitioning, it's complete nonsense. Like, <laughs> And maybe it's just, you know, because they hate themselves as women or maybe it's because they're turned on by the idea of being women or there's like there's all kinds of different motivations, a lot of autism. There's straight mm-hmm. up a lot of spectruminess. Um, and so some and sometimes you're an autistic pervert. Sometimes you're just, confu- you know, there's all kinds of stuff going yeah. on with with people who are increasingly identified as trans and non-binary. But, you, you know, anyone who knows trans women who like really seem like women like understands that. And sometimes that's the only people people know. Yeah. You know, you've met a few and they're like, these are women and I see them as women. And don't you dare say that they're not. If you only know those ones, I totally get why you think this is more black and white than it is. Right. Um, but and I know those women. I, I know I have a lot of friends, you know, comedy and otherwise who are who do really seem like women to me. A lot of trans women who seem like women to me and a few trans men who seem like men to me. Um. And then I also know a ton of trans dudes who are lesbians who are kind of escaping something. They some of them like are bisexual and they can't handle the idea that of like being with a man as a woman. Right. So they have to be um, gay men or bisexual men in order to, you know, have their psyches be okay with with being with men. Um, There's just a lot of that kind of, you know, a bunch of lesbians all become trans dude in a circle thing that you know pretty. And then on the trans women side, I know a number of trans women who do not seem like women at all to me and, you know, are tend to identify as, um, you know, they call themselves lesbian, maybe, but they're usually bisexual. Um, Mm. But they they want to date women primarily. um, And men are kind of a more of a just a sex thing for them. And so, you know, they are, I, and, and not only are they, do I think they're autogynophiles in, you know, which if anyone who doesn't know, I'm sure they all do at this point, but it's, you know, you're turned on by the idea of being a woman. Um, and the, and, and so a lot of people, you know, and, and even pursuing the physical aspects of that are, is titillating for them. Um, and they get to do it in public and all that, but you know, you would get canceled for, for using the word autogynophilia for a long time. And, that then, you know, these these trans women friends of mine would tell me, well, they've reclaimed autogynophilia. They call it AGP. So in their little trans discords, they're all like saying, yeah, we're AGP, you know, uh-huh. and like, and they're like, ha ha ha, of course. And and just like Andrea Longchu said in her in her piece about um, unliking women, um, you know, she's like, well, it's not even that necessarily we all have gender dysphoria or that you should like some of us just decided that being a man is gross and we don't want to be. And I've also heard that from some of these people. And so like, okay, well then it's not the same. There's the ones who had the gender dysphoria 
who transition, who seem like women and who like don't really raise my hackles as a man. And, and my girlfriend, who um, has had a lot of really negative experiences with men, um, you know, she immediately she's very sensitive to when there are men in the room. She doesn't really like to be around men at all. Yeah, she can help it. Yeah. But especially if it's at a sex party or if it's, you know, some kind of space where she thought it was going to be only women like or she's going to be alone with someone. She's very, very particular. She will not be alone with a man. And there are um, there are, you know, some trans women that we know because like, you know, she's I've introduced her to a lot of, of my friends and some of them she's like feels like a woman to me. Yeah. Totally. And then some of them, she's like, I would never be alone. I would please, please be careful around. Like, I don't want to even be around them very much at all Yeah, because it's particularly scary to her to have people who are presenting themselves as women who do not seem like women to her, that she's not sure if they're just completely pulling one over on everybody. Yeah, yeah. If they really think that they're women or what it is, but like men who it's like the men who think that they're good guys can be the most dangerous of all. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's the thing. It's like if I was going to do a in this house, we believe thing, one of my things would say some trans women are women. And that's it. You can't just say like anybody who says that they're a woman should be just completely given the uh, credence to that. Well, and also they're not female. Yeah, we, there's those two distinctions. Not everybody who says they're a woman is either sincere about it or right, even if they are sincere. And even if you are since as sincere as you want to be. It doesn't mean that you don't have physical differences in terms of strength and speed and whatnot, and also in terms of sexual urges and this, that, or the other. Yeah. But from my experience, the trans women who do seem like women to me don't feel like predators in, yeah. this, in the way that like kind of all men or almost all men are predatory inside to some extent. Like some control it better than others. Some it's, you know, stronger than others. But there is men are kind of predators you know yeah i don't know my I, I i don't get that at all from like my husband yeah he does know? seem like a nice little beta male so. he's not beta <laughs> though kidding. it's weird kidding. he's just very um i don't know he he's but i don't think he's common either you know i yeah. i feel like he's not the the norm right there's a huge variety and that's why i'm like it's it's true like a lot of men really and it, depending on how you're raised as well yeah. and like there's there's genetic aspects and there's raising to it but a lot of men like that, there is that potential, that testosterone, yeah. you know, your balls are filling up and the way that they experience sexual urges is different. I mean, there's a sense of urgency for men that is very different. And there's that, yeah. that thing of like, I just want to come. And then as soon as they come, they don't love you anymore. Kind of thing. like there's very different dynamics that are happening with male and female sexuality. Yeah. But it does seem like some of the, the people, some trans women really do seem to have a sexuality that's more like women, like yeah. if more female, even irrespective of the hormones that they've been taking. So there's there's all kinds of variety going on. Um, but there's a there's a lot of trans women who like because, you know, they're younger and the the schooling that people have been getting is the idea that males and females are pretty much the same. We're fungible. And the only difference between us is our genitals. Yeah. and Those don't really matter. And so and there's just enough women who think they're being feminist to be like, women are just as horny as men. It's like, all right, a few women are Maybe. Hor hornier in some ways than yeah. some men. But like, it's like saying women are hairier than men because some women are hairier than some men. But yeah. like, no, if you're going to say that men are hairier than women, that doesn't mean that every single man is hairier than every single woman. It means we've got a distribution thing going on and men are way further on that side of things. And so... And these some of these trans women, some of these people, you know, these young people in general have been confused into thinking that it's there's not that big of a deal. You can just identify as a woman and take yeah. some hormones. And it's no, it's like, no, like we really are different. We do think differently. We commute. I mean, I don't I don't want to get too crazy into the like female brain, male brain. But it's not that like, oh, we're so different. It's like hormones change the yeah. way you think and the way your urges but are. But it's so illogical, too, because if you if there wasn't this huge difference. Why would you transition? Why would you need to take a bunch of hormones? Right. And like pump yourself up with all kinds of things. To and some people think it's just aesthetic or they act like it is. And that's the craziest thing to me, to the, to the idea that like hormones is all just about looking one way. Yeah. Um, and the same thing with like the, the genital surgeries. And it's like, no, 
no, we have mind-body systems. We are mind-body systems. Yes, form, hormones change things physically. They change the way you sound if you're a trans man. Mm-hmm. They, they change your hair and they, your fat distribution and things. But they also change your brain. Hormones yeah. is a huge, like a much of the effect that we're talking about with, with taking HRT isn't just to change your body to match. It's to change your mind. Yeah. And so it's become it's to become more male or more female in the way that you think, in the way that you're driven. Yeah. And those are huge differences. And so it's like, yeah, like those things, that's also what you want to change. If you're a trans woman and you like have that dysphoria and you want to be as female as possible, you're not just trying to change how you look. You're also going, I don't want to have these violent sexual urges. Like this makes me feel gross. Yeah. Or like, I don't want to, um, I don't want to have, have that kind of hierarchical thinking or, or, you know, I don't know the differences between men and women all completely, you know what I mean? Yeah. But there are these kind of these ways that men and women get that. And 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 it's not just the physical. It's also how you smell. Yeah. Right? You know, that's how you it's how you communicate. All, you, the, all that kind of stuff is influenced by hormones. And so and some of it you can change with transition and some of it is pretty internal. And if you're not already a certain kind of way, like if you've already masculinized, if you've already gone through male puberty, male masculinization, then you've had all kinds of thoughts and fucked up feelings and, and, you know, a certain kind of attitude toward women that can come about when you have testosterone raging through you. And you can never fully put that back in the bottle. You know, you can, I mean, you see that with like, oh, sorry to interrupt, like all these images of men dressed up like women screaming at women. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you're like uh does just optically this seems bad like right. just from a pr perspective i'm not right. an expert in any of this well and in some ways you know we don't know how much is genetic versus socialization right so there's a big thing about like were you socialized as a daughter or socialized as a son were you socialized as a boy or a girl mm. because some of it could be that you're also taught you know as a man like that your opinion matters you should be loud stand up for yourself like go for it resorting to physical violence might be appropriate <laughs> yeah girl, girl girl bosses yeah we should just look up to them right and just, <laughs> um and so yeah you don't you know it's hard you you the might not new even girl realize bosses are the old bosses you what the new girl bosses are, are the, old, the bosses. old bosses yeah just rebrand <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no it's it's weird like have you experienced were you canceled i mean yes in a in a kind of more local way or, you know, there's, I've always, for, for a couple of years now, I've sometimes put out videos on, you know, Instagram or TikTok where some people will get quite mad at me, tell me that I'm kicked out of the queer community. I've been told I've been kicked out of queer community a lot. And I think that was already happening when, when we recorded the first podcast. But at this point, like I, there are lots of people who've blocked me. There are people who won't book me on shows there are um, people who complain because sometimes the Austin Chronicle will like feature the gay enough show as an event. And then there's people who like, you know, or someone put do 512 did like queer artists and they listed me and there's people, you know, saying hateful things about me and that. And basically what it is, is like, you know, I also I'm not comfortable going to my friend Ava's pervert show anymore, um, even though I love it. I think it's I think it's so funny. She used to have me on it, um, you know, fairly often. And then and, you know, they do this insane halftime show. It's hilarious. Like I but the problem is, like, I know, like, even if Ava would be kind to me, like, I know a lot of her friends, like, even the last time that I went before she canceled gender fluids, like, the last time I went, like, I, I getting dirty looks from people. And uh, and I know that if I go to even any kind of, like, gay or queer event in Austin, there's a huge likelihood that at least some of the people there will hate me. Mm. And um and sometimes they say something about it. Usually they don't. And I but I but I know what's going on. There's yeah. a lot of weird there's a lot of weird social dynamics like that. Um, so it's, you know, they don't, there's not enough, there's not enough of me to cancel. There's not enough power from that. I mean, you know right, I mean? And right. the times are changing a little, I would say in the last year or so, more people are starting to be honest and open about our criticisms and questions yeah. and debate and about this. And so they don't have that same kind of power they had. I mean, especially also just like, Twitter has changed. And yeah, things. Like, yeah. There's not there's not this ability for them to like we're, the blank check has ended. Yeah. And now more and more people are pushing back. And so it's not. And I that's part of like I was trying to kind of wait until I'm like, 
I was, you know, I was always being more open and honest in some conversations with people. My stand up was starting to really like question things, but in a way that, but in a way that I, you know, that, that was still not like, let's tear all this down. You know, yeah. it's kind of like, let's, let's start poking around in this and mm-hmm. like, and, and, and just having unorthodox thoughts. Like, and so it's not that I was going, yeah, cause I still, I don't feel like I'm not like anti-trans yeah. and I'm not pro-trans. Like it's the same way I feel about abortion where I'm like, well, shit's really nuanced. And yeah. I think we should have a nuanced look at all this. Yeah. And so I, my stand up was very nuanced and that this, my special that's coming out on the fourth is, 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 is that, that stuff I was working on for years. And some of those jokes I was telling 2017, 2018, 2019, and yep. then, and then kind of baked it all and in, into this thing and, and put it out. And now my stand up that I've been working on since the special is even more like going for it. But and what is very like anybody could watch the, the Ellen DeGenderless special and, and, you know, show that to about anybody on the political spectrum and they would be able to laugh and they would be able to hear like, you know, thought, pro, you know, thought provoking questions and jokes. And but it's never it's never anti-trans, you know, right. I mean, and as, again, it's not how I feel like I I do think adults should be able to transition. And I I know people who seem genuinely like the sex that they identify as. And I have not, and, and like I treat people just as you know as as yeah. they want to be treated um but i think that some of the people who are convinced that they are trans are mentally disturbed in many ways and should not be in charge of children's health care well that's what's weird too about like just an openly kind of admitting that you're agp you're like so we're not allowed to say that this is a mental illness but you're admitting that you have a mental well it's a paraphilia right it's right. not necessarily a mental illness to have a paraphilia but they are turned on by you know being women or being girls a lot of you know a lot of them also do age play stuff and so there's that dynamic of it too where you just got, you know, a ton, a ton of people who identify as trans women who, you know, are afforded some of the benefits that that gets them, whether that's getting booked on shows or for some people or that's, you know, getting elevated into certain positions or just having access to like the free housing. There's like a whole trans network of it's kind of <laughs> like being Jewish, you know, where you can just like get a job or get housing or get someone to pay for your groceries or you can get online and say, hey, like I'm having trans difficulty. So please, you know, give me money. Help me have some of that trans joy. Here's my Venmo, you right. know, like um, and especially I've, for years. Yeah. It's dropped off a bit. I think. Yeah, I was I was like one time I went down this rabbit hole of I forget what the, the hashtag was, but I was like, we need to have a conversation about the trans panhandling that goes on online because it is insane. I had no idea there were so many crazy. people who just you can just be like, hey, my I need some hormones or I need a surgery or it was it was crazy in from 2018 to 2020, I think was the heyday of the insanity of that. Mm. My Instagram feed Every other post was some lesbian acquaintance of mine cutting off their boobs because now they're non-binary. And I'm like, OK. Um, and then, you know, I remember one day opening up and being like, oh, another top surgery right at the top of my thing. You know, and sometimes I would see like an old friend who looking cute and I'd be like, heart. And then I would read it and be like, I'm chopping my boobs off. Finally, pay me. And I'm like, unheart. I'm like, that's how I'm going to get canceled. Someone's going to notice that. And then but then it would be like the next. The next post is a friend who's got to get a hysterectomy because she's got a cancer scare going on and she doesn't want to, you know what I mean? And it's like, and I'm like, let's donate to those GoFundMe. If you have the aesthetic, I get it. I get having aesthetic issues with your boobs, but like, that's something you really need to pay for yourself, in my opinion, at least until my friends can afford their diabetes medication and shit. Like we have way worse issues going on in healthcare. Like just the priorities are insane that we would be like, oh, all of a sudden, Someone who's been fine their whole life, all of a sudden, two years ago, discovered some shit on Tumblr and now they they hate their boobs so much that we all need to pay for it. I'm like, I'm not rich enough to be one of the people like if if you've got so much money that you're already donating very generously to like lots of causes that are really important. And then you also want to throw a few shekels their way. Great. But for the most of us, like I can't afford to help you get a boob job. Yeah. And we're not helping people who are getting boobs cut off for like the cancer cancer yeah let's go with that first (laughs) like let's make sure we're you know like prioritize like it's crazy and it really started to feel like a cult because it's like you got all these people shaving their heads and cutting their boobs off and there's a whole community kind of like 
pulling their money together. And, and you know, you always got to speak away and feel away. And like, you know, there's all this lingo that they would all use. And if you didn't, you know, and it's all just like they sound like copy paste machines. Yeah. It's like they all sound like like kind of, you know, non-binary GPT kind of thing. Yeah. Where like, why do you all say the same things and, and whatnot? And I just they they increasingly and I because I watched this with Ava, too, like increasingly they all were in more and more of their own bubble and only talking to each other because, you know, outside of that, people are going to have some dissenting thoughts. And so it's a lot easier to really only talk to each other, only read certain things, only listen to certain podcasts. And I, they just they became more and more insular. And so, you know, their ideas get crazier when they're not, you know, and they, they won't allow their Reality friends to ask tested. questions. Yeah. Right. We're not allowed to. We're told yeah. we're bad people if we do try to have hey, let me just ask a little of this. And they're like, that, you know, you're you're just one of those turfs. I went, this is something that I, I guess I feel ashamed for at the time. I was like, it drove me out of comedy to a certain extent. It was like 2018 when I started. I was at Playboy and then I wasn't at Playboy anymore. And I started, I guess, for like, just to be, for lack of a better term, it was being red-pilled, but it was really just me pointing out some of the hypocrisy I was seeing on the left in the Trump era. It was I always joke like, oh, don't make me defend Trump a clock because <laughs> things get taken out of context. I'm like, we don't need to we don't need to make it worse if it's already bad, because now you just seem like you're lying and this makes everything worse. And I ended up having a lot of friends in comedy unfollow me, block me, start openly kind of trashing me on, online and off. And it made me incredibly insecure to even go out and get on stage. Yeah. And it was at the time where I was get, start, finally getting paid to write after years of waiting tables and doing comedy. And I just really, I was down to doing like one show a month and it was only with people I kind of trusted. And yeah. I just, I kind of seeded my... I don't know. I, it was a lot of just fear and insecurity. I knew that any time I would go out, there were people who just openly were hating me and they were big names in comedy. You know, yeah. these were people with massive followings and names in the comedy world. And I it was um, it was more like, oh, you're a white supremacist than well, like a thing. turf. So much of this, it just was so clearly a power grab that anybody who was marginalized enough in the intersectional calculus would just uh, wanted to uphold this new system that we had of whose voices are going to get elevated, who gets to talk, who gets power. And so anybody who wasn't, you know, some kind of ethnic and sexual minority, and you maybe if you were disabled, you know, had to, you had to have at least two high scoring, um, yeah. you know, uh, minority things in order to you know, have any kind of power in that, you know, and if you were just gay or if you were just a woman or whatever, like you were really suspect. And so and so like the people who were upholding that, it was very clear, like this is a power grab you. And, and it's important to you guys that you be the most marginalized and you're going to talk and present things as if your group is the most in danger because it's like being, a, you know, the black trans women like that's the most powerful. Right. Because, yeah, yeah. remember how like, you know, black lives matter. If you suggested any other lives matter, that was like a dog whistle for being KKK. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was the it's like, oh, all lives matter is the most racist thing you say, whatever, um, which like I get how that functions, sort of. But there are some people who genuinely were just kind of like, well, yes, because all lives matter. Like, of course, you're like, that's crazy that you would ever like it, it's 2020. Like, of course, your life matter. was wild, too, because you could just catch something at the wrong news cycle. Right. Like I not get it. Yeah. There was that whole Esquire cover where the, the it was like a, they put they were doing like young teenage boys and they were like, what's wrong with the teen boys or something, mm -hmm. which I was like, good for Esquire for actually covering men and boys because yeah. I felt like none of the male magazines were doing that. And the first one, it was Black History Month, but the first one was this white teenager. And then the entire internet piled on this <laughs> white teenage kid. And I was, I said, I'm not going to get on board with like the demonization of this like cis white male right. or whatever. Right. I'm just not. Do and it was like, 
Yeah. I was just, I just caught that weird wave. How about if we Twitter don't came for me? Demonize and like, any demographic. Oh yeah. my god, my mentions were just like, yeah, Martin Luther King had a lot to say about that in his letter from the Birmingham prison about the good liberals, and like yeah. called me a um. Uh, like Grand Wizard. I mean, it was upsetting, definitely, um, because coming from where high I rank came from, I didn't know it was that easy to get such a high rank. Apparently, all you have to do Probably. is tweet the wrong thing at the wrong time, and it was very upsetting. And yeah. my and I had friends who were like, just log out, and it was like yeah. three days of. Yeah. But this was like comedians and people that I loved and respected, and I. It was so un upsetting and unsettling, and I. It was a power grab for a long time, which I I kind of like respect and understand too because if one of the things that I've tried to joke about for a long time not always effectively is you know the mediocre white male who's kind of just Louis CK did a bit about this and it's so funny that he ended up being like the victim of his own bit where he's mm-hmm. like all throughout history white men were like hello I'll have a seat and he's like I don't want to see the future for these guys because it's coming for us yeah and he kind of saw the writing on the the wall where yeah. it's like welcome to the thunderdome guys like yeah. a lot of people have been duking out trying to get opportunities that didn't necessarily have the connections and th- it's fake to to act like there weren't women and minorities and disabled people d- were not didn't have the same seat at the table but yeah. so i i like understood it and was like okay but i don't think that it you know, the zero sum identity politic game, I think everyone ends up losing it. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's the thing. It's right. Right. With with Black Lives Matter, you could say trans lives matter. Right. And that's <laughs> that was the one. OK. And black trans lives really matter and stuff. <laughs> but that people played that game cynically because they thought I'll never lose it. Like I have enough points. If you were if you were a person of color, unless you're Asian, then you already had enough points, right, to 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 win this game for a long time. And if you were if you were two things, then you could really. And so I think those people really knew like they could take and run with this. I mean, I don't think they're consciously like hey, hey, hey. It just kind of unconsciously happens that you're like, oh, great, like yeah, this is the right way. And then the people who are just gay or just uh, you know, something what like they were like, it's good enough. I'm on the right side of this, and so they're kind of upholding it. And then what is the cis straight, you know, Caucasian men are supposed to like fight against this. And then they're like, like, you know what I mean? Like it was set up so that they would would you didn't have to listen to anybody who wasn't agreeing with the orthodoxy. And the orthodoxy is if I have enough intersectional points, then uh, intersectional oppression points, then I'm getting the job. You're listening to me. I'm telling you to shut up. We can cancel you. We can tell you why you're wrong. And with Twitter being how it was like. That was just that was the way the game worked for a few years. Mm -hmm. And people were largely playing along with it. And and I think for most people, most of those people who are tweeting and canceling people, I don't think most of them are going like, oh, yeah, I can win this game of, you know, I think they're just they don't think that much about what's going on. And it's just kind of like, oh, cool. I'm an Indian woman. I'm just going to you know, hop onto the like, yay, my voice is finally being elevated. Yeah. Marginalized people are finally being elevated. This does make sense. This is righteous. But they're not thinking about, you know, the, the objectives of actual liberalism. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're not they're not thinking about like the long term consequences of Having authoritarianism. White people focus on their whiteness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or, you know, or on, just on deciding to the, I the feel like this is dangerous, guys. <laughs> well, and exactly. It's kind of like when you tell people for long enough that they're racist, sexist, transphobic, whatever, they do become more racist, sexist and transphobic. And when you tell people like I think my biggest problem with Black Lives Matter as the name of a movement is like you're you're setting the bar insultingly low um, and you're basically telling people that they don't think that black lives matter when you're saying that. And I'm like, what you're doing to a generation of people who, you know, everyone kind of my age or a little older or any younger, um, your age or, you know what I mean? Like anybody, anybody, honestly, who's like 55 or younger, 65 or younger, unless they live in Mississippi, you know what I mean? Or like kind of have their bunker in Wyoming. Like most of us are really not right. You know, being racist became so passe, so gross. So whatever. So the and we all have friends of ever, you know, and so like this idea when you're telling people like you don't even think black lives matter is how that comes off. And you're like, so like, some of those people don't anymore. 
that because they've been so abused by this. Yeah, it was such a weird time too. Like my, I always joke about how you get these emails, and it was like we here at whatever brand like believe Black Lives. I'm like, well, I didn't of think course you, you know, did it right. until now, and it's now I'm wondering. Fucking weird. Yeah, and it's such like, a weird revisionist history, <laughs> like, and these poor kids. Weird. The poor young people have no like they really think that we live in we have this been such a racist society. This whole time. I'm like, OK, those of us who are around in the 90s and the early aughts remember how good things were getting and not that it was perfect, but everything was going in a nice place. Like people were joking around with each other like it was it, there was a totally different feeling. Interracial dating continues to be like hugely popular, whatever. Yeah. Like if you, there's so many markers that you look at and even still you go objectively like black people are doing way better. The races are getting along. We're all and it feels like a slob boy. G-Tech had this thing where he's talked about the fall of like when you the Yugoslavia people like the Balkan people mm-hmm. were all um, they were w- when tension started getting worse. Like the, the first thing that went was the ethnic jokes. They all used mm-hmm. to tell ethnic jokes about each other. Yeah. You know, and it was one of those things that you do with your friends. Yeah. And then what he, he was like, that was the first thing once like the ethnic jokes went away and then the violence started. And I think that's really telling where it's like when you start telling people we all hate each other and we all have all this tension and things are really fucked up and then we can't joke around anymore and we can't, you know, we're all there's all these rules and and all these pitfalls, then the tension increases. But do you think there's been I mean, I think comedy is kind of booming and you being in Austin through this whole, you know, basically like explosion of the scene here people are moving to austin to start comedy which is you know just bananas from all over the country yeah um what do you you feel like that's a positive thing do you think if trump gets elected it all snaps back like a rubber band what what's your kind of like what's your vibe What's the vibe you're well, getting? What vibe are you picking up? Let's go with the Trump question because I think that's really, yeah, it that's worrisome, right? Everybody thinks, remember when everyone said Trump being elected was good for comedy and then all the comedians were like, not really because now the truth is so ridiculous that you're making fun of it's kind of weird and whatever. I mean, but I think that in terms of those of us who would prefer to be able to um, criticize the excesses of the left and and dissect wokeness and whatever. I think it is better when the stupid Democrats are in power because there's less of that like, ah, Trump's in power. You can't say anything critical of the right, left. Right, right. And that was an insane time. I mean, and I think it was the wrong decision in 2016, 2017, when Trump had just gotten elected, when we were all told, no, no, don't criticize, you know, the left because we need to just criticize the right and tell them how bad and stupid and evil they are. And, and then we'll fix things. It's like, well, we've been doing that for a long time and it's not going well yeah. to tell people that they're deplorable. It's not really been the best tactic. So maybe we should figure out what's deplorable about us. Clean that up. Circle, you know, circle the wagons in that way. Yeah. And then, you know, but so it's it feels like if Trump wins in 2024 that probably people will become really insufferable. And so in that way, like, I feel like it would be better for him not to win. But also, I really cannot stand the idea of Kamala Harris becoming the first female president, (laughs) unelected Mm -hmm. and hated. Most one of the most despised women in politics, despised people in politics. Yeah. And so our first female president is this person cynically chosen because Biden was like, I'm going to pick a woman and unspoken. It's going to be a person of color because it's 2020, you know. And so this person who is just. You know, I mean, that's the origin story because Biden will die within a couple of years, you know, (laughs) I mean, there's no way there's no way. I mean, I don't know what they because every time he has to give a speech, uh, say the union address and they pump him full of those drugs, that's taken another six months off his life in the long term, yeah. you know, <laughs> so uh, and they end up wearing off and he kind of descends into like yelling, angry old man. Yeah. And I, and I honestly I mean, I think from what I know about politics, what I try to keep up with and and learn, it seems like 
Biden and Trump administrations are both a mixed bag in terms of policy. Mm-hmm. I think some of the things are good and bad on, on either side. Some of the people and in, in their cabinets are insane and do you know what I mean? It's like it's really complicated. And I'm I'm more concerned with Congress personally than I am concerned with which of these people are is in power. I mean, I still think RFK is a much better option than either of the two of those people. Um, and that's who I'll be voting for unless something else happens. He seems like he has a lot of momentum. Yeah, in many ways. I mean, there's lots of people who still believe a lot of disinformation about him. And there's people with legitimate, you know, criticisms of his of some of his, you know, policies or thoughts. But it's also like you don't have major criticisms of the other guys, too. I'm not saying I agree with him on everything. Mm -hmm. I just agree with him on a lot more than I agree with Biden and Trump on. Plus, they're a corpse. You know, Biden's a corpse. Trump's whatever the fuck Trump is, you know, and I, RFK is younger. I, I believe in his heart more. I believe in his intellect more. Um, he's just so much more impressive to me as a person than either of those two. And he is critical of the establishment. And that's what people want. And people, you know, so much of the Trump thing is a fuck you to the establishment. It's a fuck you to giving us sort of charismatic and charming robot people who are just playing the polit- uh, you know the politics game and so we want authenticity and RFK seems to have authenticity in spades but is also more intelligent and good-hearted and then than Trump and I, so to me I'm like you can have all the criticisms you want I don't see a better option in in uh, November than RFK at this point. Yeah. I tried to get Dean Phillips into the Democratic primary and no one wanted to vote in the primaries. People yeah. still only like 5% of eligible voters uh, voted in the primary, you know, which it's such a wild it's time. Crazy. So do you think that the comedy scene here is going to kind of function as like a uh, uh, safe zone? A safe zone for comedy? Yeah. Or- Yeah, I mean, you know, Austin comedy is more complicated than people realize. Um, And because I moved here in 2015 and we had a really cool scene here. Yeah. And, you know, we have a lot of alumni who are on SNL now and and touring with big names and doing great things and coming out with Netflix specials and things. So it was a great scene. And and so there there have always been people moving here to to develop as a comedian, either, you know, brand new or they'd spent a couple of years yeah. in Ohio or something. And now they're here. Um, and but the scene was, if not, whoa, I mean, the scene was liberal. Yeah. The scene was generally liberal. Yeah. And I think that was a great thing for me because I started in Boston where, yeah, like Boston's liberal, but it's Be- Boston. It's Boston. And, well, and then not only are there like, you know, like the kind of Southie type people mitigating that, but it's also like because it's such a liberal state, then liberalism looks different. When you're a blue city in a red state, people get really like right. hunker down on our liberalism. You notice right. that in, you know, in Nashville and in Austin, all, whatever, all these places that are like blue and red. But when you're blue in what's thought of as blue, although for every state, it's like the cities are blue and the, the yeah. rest of it's red. But but when you're thought of as a blue state, um, just because that's the way the generals go and stuff, then um, the liberalism isn't as frantic. And at least it wasn't then. You know, right. I started comedy there in 2014. So I don't know how things have maybe radicalized since. But at the time, the comedy wasn't like woke at all. It was just like, of course, we're all that's liberal. Sense. But of course, we can criticize liberals because, of course, we're all liberal. You know, it's right. like we're all kind of on the same page. So we can talk about what's wrong with our side. And that was the vibe then. And then I came to Austin where it was definitely a little woker um, and much more like, oh, no, you can't ever say anything nice about red team or, critical. Yeah, you know, yeah. there was a little bit definitely more of that. But I always found because there were lots of different kind of it was a small enough scene that we all kind of knew each other. But yeah. there's also people who only did these rooms and people mm-hmm. who only and I did all of them. I traveled all throughout the city, all kinds of different rooms. And so and but most of them are pretty liberal. And I had to learn how to really talk to not that not that I couldn't like I've always been in the liberal world since college. But like but, you know, doing comedy where you have to kind of play by the rules of like, how can I make sure that these people are comfortable enough to laugh in public? Yeah. And but there was this one place called the Gatsby here in Austin on Sixth Street. It's where Malavita is now. Amazing um, dance club, but but it used to be this place called the Gatsby. And on Tuesday nights, there's a group of us who used to do comedy that's like you know more 
much more like mothership comedy uh -huh. than anything else that there was in Austin. There are a few pockets, though, of, of places where we could do kind of just just comedy, just free. It was free. Right, right. Free speech comedy. And we would say some fucked up things. And it was a really fun. But it was like we were the counterculture. You know, that right. was like the counterculture. And so in the not just Rogan, but Tony Hinchcliffe dynamic times in Austin, of course, now we have all these people moving here or visiting to do Kill Tony. And they're all these open micers who are all working on, you know, their edgiest material and everything. And so now, like, people are thinking of Austin comedy as like, this free speech edgelord kind of right. place. But I'm like, well, we really just kind of went from a little bit of that and a lot of liberal to it's really very mixed. It now. is mixed. And and I love that about Texas. I love that about yeah. Austin. It's always been purpler than people think yeah. here. Um, and so I think now it's it's much more balanced than it used to be. Yeah. It actually used to be too far on one side. And now and like people just people who don't know enough about the scene and even some people in the scene just put too much weight in mothership kill Tony dynamics. Like I love all the clubs. I want to yeah. work at all the clubs. Yeah. I'm not trying to, you know, I, but it's like you go to mothership for a certain kind of audience. You go to the Creek for a different kind of audience. You go to fallout theater for a different, you go to, you know what I mean? There's all these different places where you get to play to different audiences. And I think that's such a good thing for comics yeah. to have all of that. And so it's not like, you know, <laughs> it's not like, Oh, the scene now is that way. It's like, no, there's a lot of that. And in, and especially if you're an open mic comic, you got to put up with a lot of shit. And I don't I feel bad for for people who are starting out and like have to slug through the open mic. So I, for what I hear, it's pretty rough in terms of watching 50 men get up there and just do rape jokes and tell the say the N word. That sometimes was like L.A. Or, right. That was yeah. like when I came up in L.A. I was like, wow, really? OK, every everyone's doing rape jokes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, you know. It, so it used to be for, for open mic comics, the Austin scene used to be much more hospitable, nicer place. Mm. But, you know, but still, if you're doing shows, if you can get yourself into showcases here, we have so many different people running so many different kinds of yeah, shows. Yeah, it seems that way. And you don't really have to be one particular kind of comic or another. Yeah. It's, it's just it's a much bigger thing now. And so I like I love that about Austin. I it mean, it's feels a dream come supportive, true. supportive, actually, mm -hmm. really. I mean, even here where we are at the Creek in the Cave, the vibe is just so like it's such a nice hang and everybody feels like a community. Right. And that's nice and welcoming. And I don't know, it's been refreshing to come back in to your show, which has been also kind of interesting just to having like I it's just interesting. It's not necessarily. It's just a different audience, but it's good for me, I think, to be able to be a, get in front of liberals and all kinds of people. Because I think that's really where most people are. Yeah. Like most people are kind of just trying to figure it all out and in the middle and mm -hmm. in more and more independents are birthed every day, I think, yeah. in America. And or maybe more people are getting more polarized, but and and I think comedy is the great you know reliever of of a lot of that tension. Yeah, and I so, changed the name of the show by the way. It's now officially the Gay but Cool Show. Oh, so we'll see. Okay, we'll see if we stick with that. Some people really wanted that change, so I'm like, all right, we'll see. Um, I am so grateful for you to be able to like Ariel. For those of you who don't know, has been giving has given me a residency at her show, which was formerly the Gay Enough, and I got back on stage for the first time in years because I was kind of like, oh, I'm not going to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm a mom now, and I'm not. Uh, Moms just, don't do stand up. What? <laughs> no, I just felt like uh, I don't need to be. I mean, I remember one night I was like driving in a torrential rainstorm. I'm like, am I gonna? like die and oh, my way leave to my <laughs> child motherless so I can go do a fucking 15 minute set somewhere oh. or whatever. <laughs> the oh, answer is not. yes. Oh, please don't die uh, on the way. No, <laughs> no, show. no. It was just bad. I was like, I probably shouldn't be driving in this, but I, it, I, it's been so good. And, uh, yeah, I definitely got on stage and I was like, damn it. I can't not do this. Yeah, it's too addictive. It's too fun. It's, but it's also because of the community vibe, even doing the show here <laughs> with Ty and doing, I just opened for Dave Landau and his audiences mm -hmm. are amazing. Yeah. I love his audiences mm -hmm. so much. Um, 
that that was just like and hanging out with like Dave and Matt McClowry, like those guys are they they make me love comedy. Yeah. They're like comedians, comedians. They've been doing it forever. Dave's been at it for yeah. t- two decades at this point, I think. Yeah. And that's some of the dynamics that also I really appreciate now in the Austin comedy, the way it's changed, like in terms of like people who help you love comedy again. Yeah. More people are either moving here or visiting here more often who are inspiring, who are it's like, oh, that's right. Like I love because I was going to have to move away before. Like in 2019, I was like, I can't grow here anymore. Yeah. I'm going to have to leave, which sucks. I didn't want to go to L.A. or New York. And now I'm really glad that my like journey it. has gone that way. But the other thing that's better now as the scene is big bigger is that it w- really was more high schoolish before mm. that and that liberal you know what I mean like everybody being kind of liberal and like cliques were formed yeah. and things and it was very annoying to me because I don't like high school dynamic I like yeah. New York City where it's too big to everyone know each other and you can just be in a lot of different you know and there's some anonymity to th- you know like I I didn't want it to be this kind of thing where there was drama, I think it would be seen drama that was bigger than it ever should have been because yeah. it was too, too much like a high school. And so, and also, you know, when in comedy, you kind of have to be friends with everybody a little bit. Yeah. Um, and like when the scene is that small, the everybody that's on that list is some people you don't really want to have to talk to or spend time with. Yeah. And the scene being bigger now and more talented, it's like, it's so much nicer. I would much rather be friends with everybody in this scene um, to the extent that you have to be then be friends with everybody in the old scene to the extent you had to be. That was the weird thing about what happened with when I kind of took a step back was I was like, you know, I'm going to see you in a green room, right? Like, right. this is so weird. You're blocking me on Twitter. You know, we're going to, you in know, we're going to interact happen. in real life. Right. Yeah. That was, that was like a strange, that it's strange to me. It does feel, um, vibrant here yeah you know there's there's just like a like i think any there's any kind hierarchies just exist yeah and they're they're gonna exist in any kind of they exist in media they exist in comedy but i did feel like in comedy we were all like on the front lines together so Mm -hmm. it always felt like there was this camaraderie among comedians that was somewhat i was upset that it was somewhat shattered by like those trump years where i'm like yeah we're all eating we're supposed shit to, yeah. in fucking bar shows. Like, and we're supposed to be sleeping in cars and shit. Kind of dangerous <laughs> truth telling people, tr- people who are trying to like ch- check out where the chinks in our thoughts are. And, th- you know, we're supposed to all be, it's like, you know, Chris Rock talked about, you know, we're, I'm, there's shit I'm liberal about. There's shit I'm conservative about. Mm. You know, like all our great, all the people that inspired all of us, didn't they question everything? And weren't they all politically non-binary? Weren't they all questioners? And like the idea that then it became I, maybe partly because of like John Stewart and stuff. Like the idea of like oh that liberalism was uh, or like the com- comedy was going to be a tool of liberal thought, and so like that's how uh, we're actually gonna we're gonna do this through comedy and became more of a liberal. I don't know, but well, I think it's a. I've noticed a lot of. I've been thinking a lot about this lately because of like the Christ is King trending every day, and I'm like, oh, this is the right that I the remember. What? The Christ, like is Christ King? is King. It, the the there's Just the like, religious. They're turning back to the religious mm-hmm. right that I rem- that I uh, kind of grew up with, and yeah. I think that's why the left was always thought of as the comedians because if you made fun of God, you right. were blasphemy. It was, right. you couldn't really make those jokes if you were on the right. You'd right. be accused by your own tribe of being a blasphemer, right. taking the Lord's name in vain or being, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't, there was some sense of decency and privacy and right. and maybe some modesty. And so I don't think you're not modest if you're getting on stage. So I yeah, think there was, were just qualities about the right that made it less. Um, it created a lot of good comedians if you got out of it, but you basically had to react to your entire culture. Yeah. So I think that like if you were on the right, you and you could either just be like a Christian comedian or something or not, whatever. But right. But but to be a comedian, you basically had to be either on the left or kind of in the middle. And so but you couldn't really be on the right to be like a, a comedian in the mix. And so that like that means that the majority of people are going to be left leaning. Right. And so then that kind of pushed it in that direction once the 2016 thing fomented everybody into this whole like. But then they became puritanical. But yeah, an authoritarian and 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 had like a lot of this. And I think a lot of the comedians reacted to that rightfully. 
And now what's interesting is you see the kind of rise of this. Um, like the right had a minute where they probably could have captured so many people who were fleeing the left and they were somewhat like they were opening their tent a lot more. And it feels like that moment passed. No, Yeah. If if enough Republicans had stood up and said, hey, we just want to be the common sense party. We're not hateful anymore. We're not like religious zealots anymore. We just really care about the economy and we care about, you know, some freedoms. We don't want the government to be too big. Like that would have been so popular if they could have gotten their shit together. And, yeah. But either party, right? If either party could ever get their shit together to not be insane, yeah. then they could win. But they're they're so, you know, in the thrall of their the craziest people, the people who vote in the primaries and everything, the people who really get out to vote are the are the people on the fringes. Mm -hmm. And so the parties are both, you know, just pandering to the craziest people. Weirdly, Trump is like a little bit more center. Yeah. You know, he's pretty moderate on abortion. Right. He's pretty like a he's weirdly center even for the right. Yeah. So it's like it's strange because the right is in disarray right now. The left is in disarray. And it does seem like there's some and it's funny to see like all the comedians do seem to rally around RFK. He has he has like a big fundraiser coming up with a bunch of comedians. <laughs> um, yeah, it seems like it seems like he's got the comedy vote. So. That. Well, his episode with his wife, Cheryl, on um, Tim Dillon's podcast was so good. Like, oh, I haven't it's, heard it. You should. I recommend that to anybody because it's such an entertaining listen to you yeah. got Tim doing his thing and and Cheryl, too, you know, and 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 Cheryl's so lovable, too, that I'm like, and he like makes makes if you if you were on the fence about RFK, like she makes him such a more sympathetic character. And yeah, and like there. But he's just so like articulate about all of these things that you're like, ah, oh, that sounds like a statesman. That sounds like someone who understands what's going on with the world and cares about it. And, and that kind of Kennedy way, like, you know, the young people also maybe don't have as much of a relationship to what Jack and Bobby sounded like and like yeah. how beautiful those people were, especially Bobby, especially yeah. RFK's dad. I mean, truly, I mean, I, he was such a good man. Like it really seems like he was the real deal. And that's why I got killed, you know? And yeah. so, and, and the other thing, you know, people are like, well, RFK is just going to get killed. Like, I don't want to say good, but it's like, well, maybe people will wake the fuck up to how corrupt our government really is. If they actually kill him, if they kill another Kennedy, like, I think, <laughs> I think at least people will figure it out if they do it. Like, I just, that one's going to be a hard one. another Kennedy. <laughs> oh, well, I'm just so love that I get to see you all the time. Yeah, me too. And I'm glad that you, it's like been a crazy couple of years and it seems like you've come out more, uh, I don't know, like you you seem more... Self-assured. Yeah. It. Yeah, Settled. I think for a long time I really was in the closet about, like over the years it, tr it did transition from me like kind of carefully watching what was going on and having questions and thoughts to having real concerns to being sure about my opinion. You know, I wanted to make sure I really understood the kids yeah. health thing before I really ever can. You know what I mean? But it's like we have we have more and more data now. We have you know, I have talked to so many people. I have listened to, you know, I and and I talk to people in person. I talked I listen to everybody, every different kind of podcast. Yeah. I read every different kind of book. I don't just read irreversible damn. You know, what I mean, yeah. I also read all the memoirs from all the trans, you know, like, yeah, I'm like autistic about this gender shit. I have been I'm so into it that like I know everything. Like I met this uh, another trans chick comedian the other day. It was really funny chick, Alexa, who like you know, I would say stuff. She's like, you know about that? You know about that? I'm like, yeah. I know everything. Yeah. <laughs> I know everything. <laughs> so, you know. Even down the rabbit hole. I've, I'm, yeah, I've yeah. got, I've got the rabbit right here. And, and so, you know, like I am very sure of it. And I'm, and partly because, you know, Ava quit the gender fluids podcast and things. I'm like, you know, and I don't hang out with them anymore. Like I now I'm like, all right, I really like, I have enough trans friends who talk like real people who like, can can speak in reality that I'm like I'm no longer going to play this game yeah. of like silencing myself and whatever. I mean, I'm still a little bit careful what I put on Instagram. Um especially because jokes without the right context can yeah. really be more offensive than I want them to be. Yeah. Um but 
I know how people are in real life when I talk to them and real audiences. Yeah. And it's like there's so many trans people like people in that trans rights activist area who who really still think they have a stranglehold on yeah. the culture. And I'm like, we just don't say it in front of you. Yeah. Everyone is lying to your face at this point. Yeah. yeah. People are not tapping. And there are still are some some especially women who are, who are very like trans women are female and that's it. And anyone who's there are, there are still some of those, but increasingly most people in person in real life are like, yeah, there's some crazy shit going on with that. I don't know. We, yeah. we can't, we're, we've taken the blank check back. We got to figure out how to bring this in. And so it is time. I just think it's so important for people like you and me and like most people who, who are normal about this to be out, to come out of the closet yeah. about how we feel because we can't let everyone think that that it's the way it's depicted on social media and corporate media. We have to have we have to have people understanding like most of us are sane and kind of in the middle on this and things are nuanced and it's OK to say those things. And you're not going to get canceled anymore if you I'm Spartacus this because most of us are Spartacus yeah. on this gender shit. And it's it's time. It's yeah. time. You're not going to lose your job anymore mo in most cases. Like, yeah. well, and people will fight for you. You you'll if you do get canceled, other people will pull you up if it comes to that. Yeah. So we at, at this point, I think it's really time for everyone to be honest. I love that. Where what's your biggest defect of character? Oh god, that I talk too much. Um, but I think that I have been repressing most of my emotions for several years now. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I think I've been numbing all the negative ones and uh, and it also numbs the positive ones. You know, it's that Brene Brown shit. I think I need to talk to my new somatic therapist about unlocking that. Mm. Yeah, because I do think I've made myself into a little bit of a steel. Okay, you know, like, yeah, I, I, and it's partly with comedy. You know how it just it can hurt so much to stay up at night going over some tiny thing that happened in that set that you hate yeah, yourself for yeah. now. And I think partly with that and partly I've, I've lost a lot of people in my life and there's just, a, there's a lot of grief and things that I've, I thought I've found it easier to just laugh at than to really process. Mm. So I think that's something that, and I, and I, and, and it's easier for me to just live in my analytical mind yep. than in, in my body and feelings. And so I think that that's the biggest thing that I really need to unlock in order to evolve further as a person. Oh, I remember when I was at this sex cult ashram thing, we did <laughs> dynamic meditation and it was one of the like uh, Osho techniques. But that shit is amazing. Oh. I like sometimes think I want to do it again. It's a, it is a, talk about like unlocking things that were stuck in my body that came where I was like. I kind of became a believer in that body keeps the score just because yeah. things came up out of the blue from like when that just from like past things that had happened, feelings that were I'm like, where did this come from? This is crazy. Like I had one day where I did it and this is like not a traumatic thing, but some trauma stuff came up, too. But one day I did it where you do like this breathe. Have you ever seen this? You do like I probably. You do this, you do breathing and then you jump and you go, hoo, 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 uh -huh. hoo. and then you just get to like go crazy basically. And you can yeah. have a pillow and punch in the pillow or whatever. And then you dance. So it's like these four. Yeah. And it's this whole thing. Um, and but you weren't self-conscious in front of everyone. Well, because you could wear. Um, well, there were. Oh. First of all, you were all living in an ashram together and you knew each other anyways. Okay. But also you could wear blindfolds. Was everyone else wearing a blindfold? Some people were. OK. Um, it For was all weird, but you kind of got it. over the like yeah. self consciousness okay. in after because we did it every morning. Oh, uh, okay. And it was one day I started going, I don't want to go to school. When I just like flipped out, I'm like, where the fuck did this come from? It was like me because I was such a good wow. kid. I would never throw a tantrum. I was a rule follower, but yeah. I hated going to school. And I'm yeah. like, this was like a tantrum that I buried Whoa. <laughs> in my childhood. And it's like, yeah. that stuff is amazing when you do like somatic therapy or any yeah. of that stuff that. I've been in some of the places where they kind of do something like that, but I've never been able to get out of the self-consciousness mm. in those situations. So I, maybe I so need a sex ashram. Which is because you're a comedian. Yeah. Like, but I'm all like, that I can't shit dance. felt like, um, uh, 
like one time, it was always funny when like the Brits would come to the ashram because they're so buttoned up. And we would, the first night these Brits were there, it was like, all right, everyone's going to get into whatever animal. And it all <laughs> feels like improv class yeah. to me. I'm like, this is just acting school. Yeah. So I think if you've ever done. I have, but that the improv and dancing and anything like that that involves my body, I get very self-conscious of. And I can't, I, it's like, yeah, that's something I'm really trying to figure out is how to be freer in my body. Ah. Um, but I'm very, I've always been very self-conscious. I mean, some Do of it could be gender have, stuff too. Could be. Do you guys have, um, like my friend Julian always used to do the like dancing, just the, like free dancing. Like yeah, it's, like, it's a, like a hippie thing. What do they call that? Uh, ecstatic, ecstatic, ecstatic dance. Ecstatic dancing. Do I, they have that here? They do. They do. We should go. We want to. It's yeah. like Sunday mornings at 11. I'll so totally that, go. I go. can do that. Okay. Okay. I've meant to go for a long time. Um, Cause I, I, I did it. I started doing one once at like a party that was happening at that polyamorous commune place that <laughs> <laughs> we had like a yurt deck that we were having a dance party. On. <laughs> you and I have a lot of <laughs> yeah. material. So, and I had just done Molly and like was coming up while this thing. So I was like, I was super into the ecstatic dance that night, but then the uh, neighbors complained about the noise. So we had to cut it off. Like right when everyone was peaking, oh, you know, right God. when the music was like, we were just, you know, so I've, I've meant to go back and be like, well, if I could like have this without drugs, like that would be really cool. Um, yeah, you should do it sober. Yeah, no, I would I would do it sober this on a Sunday morning. <laughs> um, but that helped me a lot, too, doing the ecstatic dancing. Yeah, because yeah, I had a yeah. similar thing of like made of armor detached. Yeah. And then I got sober and that was like, whoa, OK, I can't escape from this. Can and I just be California sober and do that or do I? I mean, you can. I I would encourage you to try and do it just like sober. So well, no, I mean for the dance, I will. But I'm for just being in life. I'm like, do I? I always wonder. I'm like, uh, do I have? If I do, I need to get all the way sober to no. be vulnerable. No. Okay. Cool. I mean, I had to. I, yeah, because I don't have the same kind of. Th I smoke a lot of weed though. So yeah, but I was that was my true love. You mean drinking. with weed? Oh, weed. Yeah. Oh no, weed oh, is my drug to. of choice. Yeah. Like still to this day, I'm like, do I really need to be sober? Because what about a little edible stuff? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's the I'm I've bad. said it on Rogan. I'm like, it's like the fuzzy distance between me and light and life right, that but... it keeps me. I mean, the rage that came up when I quit smoking weed, I was See, shocked. That's what I'm wondering is if maybe I have. It was maybe like rage. rage. I might. I probably have rage. Yeah. So much rage. I had no idea. You should do a cleanse. I couldn't even sit in I could not wait in traffic, wait in line. I was like, whoa, this was. Were you, were you high made... throughout the day before? Oh, all okay. day. Because I usually wait until night, usually. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. No, I was, I was like, wake, wake and bake. Okay. You're I was like, going to okay, say, though, you know, like bad. some of these sex ashram cult places, <laughs> even though it's like feels weird to be like appreciating there, a lot of them do have good therapeutic, you know, like even Heaven's Gate had great guided meditations. <laughs> People don't know. It wasn't until like, you know, went into the whole let's kill ourselves thing that it was a problem because they had theological issue that they had to square. But before that, like a lot of these places really do have a lot of positive things going on and it's just that i mean there there was definitely a dark side of yeah. this place that came out yeah. after the fact that i could always well, there's a man sense. in charge of a sex cult it tends to go wrong <sighs> it's just I, a lot i've watched a lot of people lose their minds on ashrams and i think yeah. there's a certain aspect of like hiding from you know you go you when you start traveling the world and you're out and there at a certain point it, it traveling in and of itself becomes an escape running away yeah, yeah. you're just it's a lot of lost right so then you got souls. a self-selection thing exactly yeah. like the people who are going there and then they're all together feeding each other yeah whatever's going wrong i do miss from one of the ashrams i went to the golden silence where they did eight to eight you couldn't talk it was like oh. i mean it was very tough my friend and i would be writing each other notes like in high school but yeah. it was there was something nice about that you yeah. would Basically, after dinner, you went into the golden silence and then you had meditation and chanting and all this stuff and mm -hmm. then breakfast in silence and then you were allowed to talk. Okay. I mean, I kind of <laughs> like that. I, I tried to do just the other day. I was trying to get okay. in touch with my emotions and I was like... OK, I'm only going to either name emotions or speak in a different language. And I don't have a really like I speak a little bit of a lot of languages. And yeah. so I'm like, all right, this is a good way for me to like shut the fuck up a little bit. But if I really need to communicate something, I'm like, uh, necesito ayuda con ese, whatever. You know, like. What's your biggest asset? 
Uh, I think that I truly like care about making the world a better place in a way that's like, uh, um, like I really try not to be one of those people who's like thinking they're making the world a better place, but is a road to hell paid with good intentions. Yeah. Like I really try to think deeply about like how we can how we can improve the world and like I really have empathy for everybody and yeah. I really like I've always been someone who um you know would notice if there was someone who was shy in a circle and like go talk to them or like if someone was I remember I used to work at Trader Joe's and there was a woman with like crazy burn scars and like everybody else was super uncomfortable ringing her up and so I just told the person who's in her, I'm just like, just try to send her to me because I'm fine. You know, like yeah. I really don't like look down on people yeah. for their for whatever's going on. You know, I do, I mean, I look down on people who aren't funny, I guess, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I do look down on like that kind of, you know, it's, it's just intelligence based. Like I'm I'm not not discerning about about people's qualities, but like I do believe that everybody is, except for rapists, everybody is like a valuable person with something to contribute, who's interesting, who deserves um love and respect. And like I I just I want us all to figure out like how we can make the world better. And I think that like if more people were focused on that and not just like being right or you know, these utopian yeah. ideals, like people have utopian ideals, but there's no path to get there. And I and they're not they don't seem to worry about the shorter term consequences of trade-offs. their thing. All the trade. Like I think about trade offs so much. I yeah. guess that would be the thing is like I'm always thinking about trade offs. And I really, you know, like Jonathan Haidt's book, The Righteous Mind, I like is my favorite work of nonfiction. And I think like that helps solidify where I was kind of already at with my empathy for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things I just recommend to anybody intelligent enough to read that book mm -hmm. to go and check that out. Because like that, I guess that's that's the real thing is this like I'm pretty immune from the polarization. Yeah. I'm pretty immune from this kind of team thinking like it's this way or the other. Like I see everybody's point and I care about everybody's point. And so I'm tr always trying to get other people to see everybody's point. I love that. Where can we find you? Well, on April 4th, my comedy special Ellen DeGenderless comes out on YouTube. Yay, finally. Yes, yes exactly. Hopefully it's still topical enough. Um, and then so you can f follow me on Instagram at Ellen DeGenderless. And then I also have a podcast called Politically Non-Binary where, you know, you've been a guest and people will come on and confess a controversial opinion or two. And we just discuss that with someone who's going to question it, but also see your point. And yeah, those are the most important things. You can also follow me on OnlyFans at Ellen DeGenderless. Thank you it's so much. Comedy. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Pluto TV has over 300 channels and thousands of TV shows and movies for whatever mood you're in. Just open the app and something good will already be playing because it's curated by people who love TV as much as you do. So if you're in the mood for comedy, there's 18 channels that'll make you laugh. Looking for drama? We got so much of it, you'll cry tears of joy. Reality shows, game shows, sports, Star Trek, and even more Star Trek. No matter what mood you're in, there's something on Pluto TV. Just download the app and start streaming. Pluto TV. Stream now, pay never. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Phetasy. I'm Bridget Phetasy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>